Welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Good to see you here in the room. Welcome to anyone watching at home as well. We're going to begin um, by singing the good news of Jesus. What, what brings us together is the story of all that Jesus has done for us. We're going to sing about that story now. So let's stand together and sing. Welcome to the Matthews. I'm Claire and I'm on the, the staff team here 
Um, we uh, have uh, groups for children um, and young people. We've got a creche for children up to their third birthday. Um, and there's a parent and child room through there, which you're very welcome to use at any point uh, during the service. You can see in here uh, what's going on, and there's some toys in there uh, for the children to play with. Um, and the map there shows where our other uh, groups are. There's a group for the uh, upstairs, and then the other groups are down uh, the corridor. If you don't know where to go when we send the children out in a little bit, uh, then do come and ask me. I'll be sort of hovering um, by the door um, over there. Perhaps we can have the, the next PowerPoint up. Okay, children, would you like to come down to the front? And we're going to be thinking a little bit about what we're going to be learning in and hearing about in our children's groups. So I can see this, these are not difficult, so you can, we can sort of shout out the answers. That little boy, how is that little boy feeling? How do you think? Yeah. Happy, brilliant, happy. What about her? How is she feeling? We've had a lot of this recently, haven't we, Sam? Sad. Why is she sad? Yeah, that's right, it's raining and she wanted to go out and play football. What about that little girl? How's that little girl feeling, Katie? Why is she feeling excited? She's sorry? She, she, yeah, she got an invitation, something. Yeah, something exciting about it. Let's quickly through. But what about that little girl? How's she feeling? Yeah? Scared? What's she scared of? Lightly, yeah, Rusty, you're right there. Now, what about that little boy? The boy in the green jumper, how's he feeling? Ooh, have a bit of a think on that one. What do you think, Lucy? Why is he cross? Okay, so lots of different feelings we might feel. You might have felt all of those today or maybe this past week. But I wonder, oh, I've forgotten this one. What about that boy? <coughs> Sad. And that little girl? Sad. So lots of different feelings we might feel. She's sad because her toy's broken. I wonder, think about those feelings. Which feelings could we go to Jesus with? Let's do a thumbs up and thumbs down. If we're feeling happy, can we go to Jesus? Okay. Well, I, can't, I can't do thumbs up and on the paper. Okay. Sad, what do you think? Can we go to Jesus when we're sad? Ooh. Excited? Yeah, I'm not so sure, are we? Scared? Yeah, okay. A bit of a think. Angry. Can we go to Jesus when we're feeling angry? When we're crying, can we go to Jesus when we're crying, when things really hurt? What we're going to be thinking about today is we're going to be thinking, in the Bible, we know don't we, that Jesus was a human, just like us. He was a baby and a child and a toddler, a teenager and adult. He lived in the same world as we did, so he experienced all those things. Do you think Jesus felt happy? Yes. Do you think Jesus felt sad? Do you think Jesus cried? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to see that. There's a picture there of Jesus crying in our children's groups. We're going to be looking at John chapter 11. And in verse 35, it says, Jesus cried. He cried because something really, really sad had happened. One of his friends, Lazarus, had died. And his, Lazarus' his sisters came to Jesus and they got big questions. And they were very sad and they were a bit angry as well. Jesus knew, we're going to find that, that death wasn't the end for his friends. He knew that one day sadness and suffering would come to an end. But even knowing that, Jesus still felt sad, and Jesus cried. And, you know, we live in a hurting world, don't we? And we can know that Jesus feels our heartaches, and he hears our big questions. We can come to him with everything that makes us cry. We can tell Jesus how it is, and we can say, why is this happening? And know that Jesus understands. And we know that one day we'll be in a world where there'll be no more tears. But until that day, there will be sad things that happen. We will have tears. But we'll also have Jesus with us right by our side, loving us, answering us, and even crying with us. And so we can talk to Jesus however we're feeling. He can understand our struggles 
and we can go to him with every struggle and every question. So on a Sunday in our children's group, we're doing a series called Who Am I? Looking at about what the Bible says about who we are. And this is today's session. Today's session is I'm Hurting. And we're looking about how we're affected by living in a broken world and how we can come to Jesus, whatever happens. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that you sent him to live on earth in world in our world, so that he knows what it's like. He understands and he cares. We thank you that we can go to him however we are feeling. And particularly when we're feeling sad or confused, we've got big questions about hard things that are happening. Help us also to hold on to that promise that one day there will be a future where there'll be no sadness, nothing bad, nothing hard, nothing difficult, and no more tears. Amen. We're going to sing uh, a song. Jesus said, if I am weak, I can come to him. And it's a song that reminds us, however we're feeling, whatever's happening, we can come to Jesus. And there are actions to go with it. So if you want to stand up and join him. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come to him. No one else can satisfy, I should come to him. Jesus said if I am weak, I should come to him. stay standing. Um, adults, we're going to, you're going to continue singing, you're going to continue singing and we're going to sing in the song, Who Breaks the Power of Sin and Darkness? And children and young people, it's time for you now to go out to your groups. Stronger 
Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the amazing good news that Jesus laid down his life on the cross that we can be forgiven. And we, we come to you day by day, week by week, and we depend on that. We rely on you. We, we admit to you that we fall short and that we turn away from you. We disobey you. But we praise you that you've, you've dealt with that that you've taken away the penalty for our sins, the punishment for all that we've done wrong on the cross, and that you've given us new life and new hope. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on at St. Matthew's. By the way, if I haven't met you before, my name is, is Frank, and uh, I'm the vicar here, and I'd love to get a chance to meet you in person and say hello to you. I'll be over by the door uh, at the end as you make your way out, so please do um, say hello to me if I haven't met you before. Um, we, we're focusing at the moment on our financial giving appeal. We don't talk about this every Sunday. If you're a visitor here, uh, please feel free to switch off for a few moments. We're not, uh, we're really offering uh, everything at church free. We don't expect you to pay anything, but often when people have joined St. Matthew's and become long-term members, they often want to, to help with all that we're doing. Uh, some are able to give time, some are able to give financially, and that's how we, uh, we have a, a staff team here and how we support mission partners elsewhere in the world uh, and how we keep everything running that we're doing as a church. So this time of year, we encourage everyone to pray about that and review it and think about giving and whether that's right for you, um, whether your income has changed and reviewing it. Now, Tabs is our treasurer and has kindly agreed to come um, and answer a couple of questions and tell us how things are going at the moment. Some of you will know more about this from our annual meeting yesterday. Not everyone would have was able to be there. So, Tabs, just give us a little bit of a, a summary. First of all, thank you for all the hard work that you do behind the scenes, keeping me out of prison um, and keeping everything legal. Um, and I know a lot of a lot of time and energy goes into just making sure that we're keeping track of what's going on and uh, giving us advice and, and all of that. Very grateful to you for that. Um, just tell us a little bit about how finances are going at the moment at St Matthews. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, some of you might not know lots of the detail of our finances. Um, so predominantly, most of what we've done, we do is funded by the giving that people in the congregation give us. So that's where the majority of our money comes from. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think we, like all churches and all organisations, face that... Um, that issue of rising costs that we see everywhere in the same way that we're all seeing that in our own lives, you see that in church as well. Um, a big part of our expenditure is to do with our salaries and our wage budget. So um, again, we, we track our staff pay against teachers pay, so that's rising, so therefore um, that puts our costs up. Um, you'll be pleased to know none of our staff are on strike at the minute, I don't think, but who knows. Um, so. Yeah, so we've got those kind of rising costs and then and we're reliant on what the congregation gives us. And um, I have to say that um, the accountant in me always stresses about things absolutely balancing and it find, I find that, you know, I really want things to match up nicely. But, but from a Christian perspective, it's so encouraging to see the way that, that God provides and that you might start the year thinking we don't quite know how we're going to make this. We really think we should be doing these things and we think that's what God's calling us to do. Um, and then just seeing the way that God has provided. So God has really generously provided over the last years, um, which has been amazing. And I think, um, but we just know that there are those pressures coming down the line. And so, um, yeah, it's that if, uh, this chance for us to think about kind of where our finances are and, and what we're doing as a church. I actually can't remember the original question, but... Uh, how the finances are going. Oh, right. well, I, think yeah, I think you've answered it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> the, well, most people are happy with just a one-word answer. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I know. I, it, it's, it's, it's great to hear a bit more. Um, and all of that's in the annual report as well, isn't it? If anybody hasn't seen that yet, there are still some copies uh, at the back with a lot more detail for anyone who wants it. And there's it. more detail on the website with, with a kind of full account. So if, if you're someone who loves a, a spreadsheet and some accounts, if you want to come and talk to me about the detail, please do. Don't, don't feel you can't do that um, because sometimes some of the way things are, some of the descriptions might just not be completely transparent to you. So do come and ask me if there's anything you want to know. What does this bit mean? And why are we encouraging people to pray and review their, their giving? Why do we do that each year at this time of year? Um, I, think, I think it's a really healthy practice. I certainly know for me that I'm, I'm generally quite lazy, and so I've got, 
I mean, I've got a direct debit set up and then I never think about it again and it just happens. And so I think it's really, I think it's really good for all of us to have that opportunity to stop and think about what am I giving and, and maybe have I never given before and, and maybe this is right for me to do that or has my pay changed and actually I want to give it and the, um, in Corinthians it talks about that kind of your, your, what you give to the church being in line with what you're receiving with your income. So um, do I need to go back and think about that? Should I therefore be giving a bit more or maybe I need to be giving a bit less than I've been giving in the past? So I think it's just, it's just really helpful to I think have an opportunity to stop and reconsider what you're doing um, and so I think that's what we're asking people to do and um, but also knowing that for some people particularly that finances are really squeezed at the minute and it might not be appropriate for you to keep giving in the way that you're giving and that is also fine um, but equally you might be someone who can give a bit more and so just for us to take that opportunity to look at for where each of us is and um, and again the bible talks about us that it's about our heart attitude so this is not about you know, what I feel I should do and what other people will think, but it, this is between, you know, me and God, what I give and um, what is right, and God knows how, my heart, how I am in my heart. And in terms of giving, just to kind of reassure any of you, there are, there are probably only two of us in church who know at all what anyone gives. So Frank, the rest of the leadership team have no idea who's giving what. Um, and one of the people being me, I've got no memory for these things, so I won't, you know, when I'm talking to you in church, I've no idea. Um, so, yeah, so I think, remember, that it really is between you and God to think about. That's great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tams. Um, there is also a bit more detail on the website uh, on that page that you can see there on the screen, which tells you sort of different options for how you might want to give. Um, there's some bank details there if you want to use the bank. There are some envelopes over uh, in the corner there and a place that you can leave envelopes um, if you prefer to give cash or, or checks uh, and also of course if you pay tax in the UK then it's really helpful to fill out a form because then the church can claim back some of that tax um, after you've made a donation all of that is on the website good I'm going to hand over to George who's agreed to come and lead us in prayer thanks very much George Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in humility and praise. Thank you for seeing us through another week and bringing us together before you. Lord Jesus, in your faithfulness to us, you show us with grace, mercy, love, and all that we need. We pray that you will shape our hearts and that we will be filled with gratitude. God, we know this week has not been easy for many people. We seek your guidance and discernment as we face tough choices and hard situations every day. Although we may not be where we wanted to be today, and things might not have worked out in our favor this week, Help us to remember you are in control and that we are your beloved children. Father God, make us great evangelists to your great message of salvation to the world around us. Help us to live today in a way that brings honor and glory to your holy name. Help us to be prayerful Help us to be like prayerful Hannah and faithful Job, who face difficult challenges and difficult seasons in life, but their trust and faith in you did not waver. We pray for those people in difficult situations that with your power they will overcome the challenges and become symbols of great testimonies when the storms in their lives have disappeared. Help us to remember your love and grace and to be faithful in serving you in all circumstances, and always to turn to you for guidance and strength. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we pray for you. God, we thank you for blessing us with resources to support the spread of your good news. 
We pray that you will continue to lift up our church finances and provide the resources the church needs to preach the gospel. We may sow in our church without reluctance and compulsion. Make all grace abound so we have all we need for every good work you've given us. Make us rich in ways that result in generosity on our part to honor you and glorify your name. Amen. Dear God, the end of the year exam can be challenging and stressful time for students of all ages. The sheer volume of work and never-ending to-do list can seem daunting and overwhelming or is even impossible to get through. We thank you, God, for the gift of education and opportunity to learn new skills and sit exams. We pray, God, that you'll make students to stay relaxed as they take exams. We pray that these exams will be a celebration of all that they have learned and that they will be grateful for all they have experienced and achieved as they move to the next chapter of their career. We pray that teachers and parents will be patient and understanding as they support those sitting exams. Father God, may you help them to keep their eyes fixed on you throughout this season and always. And help them to remember that you are always with us, always fighting for us, and always faithful to us in all seasons. Amen. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we are here, ready to hear your word this morning. Help us to worship you with an undistracted heart. We pray for blessings for Liz and John as they read your word from the Bible. We pray for Frank as he leads our service this morning. We pray that the Holy Spirit will guide them and that your Holy Spirit will be at work, opening our ears to hear, our hearts to receive your word, which is living and true. We trust that you will use Frank as he preaches and that today's message will be a blessing and encouragement to us all. Amen. Thank you very much, George. We're going to turn to the Bible readings now. So if you could <clears throat> find the, the page in a church Bible, there are some more church Bibles by the door. We've got large print Bibles. Um, you can find the Bible in your own language on that website or using that uh, um, QR code. Uh, and we're, we're going to be looking at Titus chapter 3 and verse 3 on page 1199 of the Church Bibles to start with. So I'm going to hand over to Lloyd uh, to read and then Joan afterwards. Thank you. So reading Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passion and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Our second reading can be found on page 1065. 1065, and it's John chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, 
No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, please do keep open that, um, the Bible at, at that page, at John chapter 3, page 1065. Uh, we're going to be looking around the Bible at lots of verses, but including those verses. How are people made new? That's the title this morning. How can you turn over a new leaf? How can someone really change? Can they change at all? There's an old cartoon by Gary Larson with a dog uh, on a tightrope, riding a unicycle, juggling and balancing a jar on its head. Underneath the cartoon, there is a caption that reads, high above the hushed crowd, Rex tried to remain focused. Still, he couldn't shake off one nagging thought. He was an old dog, and this was a new trick. <laughs> Evangelical Christianity is full of people changing. It's full of stories of conversions, of people's lives being completely transformed. Paul persecuted, Paul in the Bible persecuted Christians and put them to death until he became a Christian and a missionary and went out to tell others. Someone called Augustine went off the rails at university. His mum was back home in tears praying for him. He was led astray by all kinds of secular philosophies. He slept around. He got a girl pregnant. Um, then he was in a, a garden. He overheard some children singing a nursery rhyme, take it and read. So he thought, well, I'll take the Bible and open it at random and pick a page and read something. And he read words that changed his life. He felt the weight of guilt lift. Uh, and he became a Christian leader and a Christian writer that went on to have an influence on the Western church for something like a thousand years. Or Luther. Luther was a monk. He was desperate to be good enough and always failing until he finally understood Romans chapter 3 and realized that the right way to be right with God is by trusting in Jesus who died for him. He wrote these words. I felt I was, as he got to that point in Romans, as the light bulb went on, he said, I felt I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. God used him to bring about a reformation that transformed Europe. Or there's John Newton, the, the slave trader who kidnapped people from Africa and sold them into a terrible existence, who met Jesus and wrote the hymn Amazing Grace and then joined the campaign to abolish the slave trade. Or well, there's uh, Joni Erickson Tarda, paralyzed from the neck down by a, a diving accident as a teenager. She wanted to kill herself, if only she could, but she couldn't use her, her, her arms or her legs. She couldn't find a way to kill herself. Um, but she was turned around completely by faith in Jesus. Um, she wrote later that she had, now has a heartfelt gratitude for this life in a wheelchair that could only have come from God. She became an author, a radio host, started a charity, and helped draft disability legislation in the USA. Well, there are as many stories like that as there are Christians, and there are lots of, um, of people in this room who could and who have told their story of coming to know Jesus and being changed. How does that happen? How are people made new. We're looking at the moment, we're taking a break, normally we work through the Bible little by little, we're taking a break from that and having an overview of what the Bible says about being evangelical. Being evangelical, as the word simply means gospel people, as we've seen people who are won over by the good news, the evangel, the good news of Jesus Christ. We're on to talk four, we're looking today at the necessity of conversion. In other words, 
how are people made new? And the first part of the answer to that question, how are people made new, is not our efforts, not by our own efforts. We're too sinful to fix ourselves. We're so um, deep in our sin as human beings that we won't seek God and we won't change our ways and we won't want to be different unless God steps in to help us. And that's what is we're learning from that little reading about Nicodemus and Jesus that we just heard, John 3. Let me, let me read from it again from the first verse on page 1065, John 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. If anyone could receive eternal life by their own status, by their own achievement, surely it would be Nicodemus. We're told he was a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Later on, Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel. So he's a sort of archbishop, um, a professor of theology, uh, a, a, a local MP, uh, something along those lines. If he went on mastermind, his specialist subject would have been the kingdom of God. And yet Jesus says to him, you can't even see the kingdom of God, let alone enter it or belong to it or, or be part of it. None of that, that respectability, none of those achievements, none of that recognition, none of that long life or wisdom that you've got will help you in any way unless you are born again, says Jesus. What a thing to say to someone at the end of a long and impressive life someone who's risen to an important status, to say, well, none of that counts. You've got to be born again. It's like being a baby again. You can cancel that whole life and all the achievements and status and wisdom and go back to the very beginning and have a new start. That's what you need. And that word, unless, in verse 3, is a very black and white word. No one can see the kingdom unless he is born again. Why would Jesus say that? Well, I guess because our, our sinfulness as human beings is so deeply embedded and so serious elsewhere in the bible it's it's put like this as for you you were dead in your transgressions and sins the spiritual problem is humanity is is a serious one we are already spiritually dead we're not just a little bit sick a little unhealthy it's not that we just need a bit of a nudge in the right direction a bit of good advice a bit of help to work out how to improve ourselves we are dead. A dead person cannot help themselves and can't be helped except by a complete miracle from God. Uh, or Romans 8 unpacks it, uh, what it's like to, uh, what we're like as people without the help of, of God, without Jesus. The mind governed by the flesh, in other words, governed by our, our humanness, our humanity, our sinful, fallen nature as human beings the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to god our thinking treats god as as our enemy uh, it doesn't submit to god's law we don't hear god's commands about how to live and then obey them and comply with them that's not how we are as human beings we don't submit we're rebels we want to make our own decisions about right and wrong and live life our own way we, we try and push god off his throne and rebel against him the, the, the human mind does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. We are incapable of being the people that God commands us to be and the people that we, we should be. We're spiritually dead. And that is true no matter who we are or what we've achieved, as Jesus said to Nicodemus. Bishop John Taylor Smith was chaplain general of the British Army around the time of the First World War. He was preaching in a large cathedral and preaching on the words, you must be born again. And he said to this big crowd, um, my dear people, you, you may be a member of, of a church, but church membership is not new birth. You may be a clergyman, like my friend the rector sitting here, and not be born again. You might even be an archdeacon, like uh, my friend sat to my right here, or even a bishop like myself, and still not be born again. 
several days later, he received a letter from the archdeacon who had been sat to his right. My dear bishop, you have found me out. I've been a clergyman for over 30 years when you pointed at me and said that a person could be an archdeacon and not be born again, I finally understood what my problem was. We cannot be born again. We can't see the kingdom of God by our own efforts. How are people made new? Not by our efforts, that's the first thing. And then secondly, but by the Holy Spirit. God sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives to make us into new people. Here's what Jesus said about it to Nicodemus. Have a look down again at John chapter 3 and verse 6 on page 1065. John chapter 3 and verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit, Jesus says. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit who gives that new birth, that new life, who enables us to become a follower of Jesus and a real Christian. That work is, is God's work. It's his initiative. It's not something we can do for ourselves. Or, or we had it unpacked for us in our, our first reading from Titus. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He saved us. It's not that we save ourselves, it's that God saved us. And how did God do that? Well, he did it through rebirth, being born again, as Jesus says. He did it uh, through renewal, by being made new, by being refreshed and restored and renewed as people. And he did that by washing away our, our guilt, our sinfulness, our, our rejection of God, washing that away on the inside by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says the Spirit is like wind. You can't see him, but you can see what the wind does. You can see the difference the wind makes. You can see the Holy Spirit's impact on a person sometimes, but you can't see and control his work. He takes the initiative of coming into our lives to give us that new birth and that new start. In the book of Acts, Peter is speaking to a, a Roman military leader from a non-Christian uh, and non-Jewish background. The whole household are there. And as Peter speaks and explains about the good news of Jesus, we're told by the writer that the Holy Spirit comes on all the listeners. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. That's how people are born again. They hear about Jesus. And as they hear from the Bible, as they hear the good news, as they hear about Jesus, they find that within them, God is at work. Now, there is a real decision for us to make. There is a choice for us to make. Jesus says to people, uh, he invites people to come to me, Jesus says. He says uh, to people they need to repent or they need to believe. In other words, repent, they need to turn away from um, their sinfulness and, and selfishness and following themselves and, and all that has gone wrong and all that's, all that's been, been, been bad and misled in their lives. Repent of that, see it, feel the, the shame of that, turn away from that, admit it, and, and trust in Jesus. Faith, in other words, put our reliance, our dependence on Jesus, that he forgives us because he died for us and paid the penalty, that he gives us hope and life because he rose from the dead. And we're invited to make that decision, to turn and to trust. But the point is we're not going to want to do that. We're not going to choose to do that. We're not going to believe that it's true. We're going to resist it and defy it with all our, our inward sort of stubbornness and spiritual blindness unless the Holy Spirit intervenes. It's only because the Holy Spirit gets really under the skin with us and gets inside. And we, we start to feel that guilt and shame and regret it. And we start to see the goodness of Jesus and his love and his mercy and his hope and choose to trust him. It's only the Holy Spirit that makes that possible. Opening blind eyes, giving light to dark minds. Sometimes when people are baptized, they, they wear a T-shirt. You can buy them online. 
a T-shirt that says something like this, I choose Jesus. Well, I particularly like this version of the T-shirt because it's got in small writing uh, underneath, I choose Jesus, the one who first chose me. And then a Bible verse where Jesus says that that is how it is. We do, it's true, we do need to choose Jesus, but we can only do it and will only do it as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and minds and as we're born again. How are people made new? Not our own efforts, but the Holy Spirit giving new life. That's the third thing. The Holy Spirit gives new lives. Christians are brought to life again by God and given a life that carries on not just in this life, but lasts forever after we die as well. A couple of places, a couple more places in the Bible that talk about uh, new birth, being born again. It's not just one passage, it's a constant theme in the Bible. Here's a couple more. 1 Peter. In his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The new birth that we have, being born again, gives us the hope of, of living, a living hope. And it does that because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. If God is able to raise Jesus from the dead, then he's able to raise from the dead all who put their faith and trust in Jesus and follow him. Uh, a bit later on in the chapter, Peter writes, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed. In other words, the first time you were born, it, it, it was with a, like a seed being planted in the ground. It was a, a seed that is perishable, that will die. The first life that you have as you come into this world is is a short life. We're dying for our whole lives. It's perishable. We won't live forever. But this new life that we're given by, by the Holy Spirit, this new birth that we're given when we hear about Jesus, is imperishable and lasts. It begins in this life, but it doesn't end in this life. There's a new person within us that will live on um, after we die and that has a whole new life, a whole new attitude. For some people, that new birth might be uh, very sudden. It might not take much longer than your first birth when you were first born. For some people, I can tell you that my spiritual birthday uh, was the 1st of August 1980. I don't know the exact time, but I'm guessing around 11.30 a.m., something like that. As having heard about Jesus, um, the Holy Spirit worked in me, and I said, yes, this is for me. Uh, and I, I went forward at the end to, to pray uh, and to speak to those who were, were leading that event. Not everyone knows their spiritual birthday. Not every Christian can remember the turning point. It can happen so slowly and gradually that you only realize later that it has happened and you can't pick the exact moment. When you cross, Jesus spoke about crossing from death to life. That's what new birth is. And when you cross over from a border, from one country into another, sometimes you know the moment you've crossed the border because you, you have to get out of the vehicle at the border control and show your passport and get a stamp on it. And there's a line on the road and a sign that says, welcome to wherever, and you know you've crossed the border. Other times you might be uh, dozing on a train or, or on a plane looking down at the countryside. And you have no idea at what point you crossed from Romania or into, into Hungary. The only thing you know is that as you, as you carry on your journey, you know you must have passed those borders at some point behind you. Not everyone knows the moment, but there always is a moment. There must be a new birth. Um, otherwise, we can't belong to God's kingdom. We're not qualified to be with God forever without the help of the Holy Spirit and the new birth. So imagine for a moment, I know this is going to take quite a lot of imagination, but imagine for a moment that I have decided that I would like to qualify to represent Sweden in the Eurovision Song Contest. Because I've, I've decided that Sweden are always a good bet uh, and much more likely to do well and win than the UK. And so what I, what I want in my life, that's my, my life's ambition, is to qualify for Sweden. I want to win twice like Loreen. Now, it, there's not much I can do to qualify for Sweden. It's no good trying really hard. I'm going to work on my singing techniques. I'm going to work on my dance routines. I'm going to get some of those long uh, sort of fingernails that Loreen has, has got attached to her fingers. I'm going to have the smoke machines and learn all the lyrics. None of that is going to qualify me. However convincing I am, you might think I wouldn't be very convincing, but however convincing I am, none of that is going to qualify me 
the only way that you can be qualified to sing for Sweden in the Eurovision Song Contest is to be born Swedish. And the only way you can qualify to be part of God's eternal kingdom forever is to be born into that kingdom, to be born again, to be given new life by the Holy Spirit. How are people made new? Not by our efforts, but by the Holy Spirit giving us new life and finally giving us new hearts, giving us new hearts. We receive new desires and attitudes when God gives us that new birth. God changes us from the inside out to make us more like Jesus by changing our, our, our goals and our motives and our desires before that then changes our behavior. Uh, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel spoke about this. Uh, Ezekiel 36, God says to his people, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Do you see what he's saying there? I'll put a whole new heart, in other words, new, um, new goals, new attitudes, new desires, new love for God and for others, a new spirit into you. He'll take away the heart of stone. As human beings, we have cold hearts, hard hearts, resistant, reluctant, indifferent to God, refusing him, uncaring, um, about those he has put around us. And God says, I'll, I'll do heart surgery on you. I'll take away that, that coldness and that stubbornness and that hardness, and I'll give you a, new, a whole new attitude, a whole fresh love, and make you a whole new person. So that you are moved. So that it's not, you know, God has got his decrees, he's got his laws. He tells us in the Ten Commandments, um, he tells us don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't desire what others have, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, all of those commands that he gives us in the Bible. Instead of just being rules that we have to keep and don't want to keep, that we resent and don't welcome, he takes them and he puts them in our hearts as he gives us new birth so that we want to be that person. We long to be like that. We are that person now. And that's our new goal and our new direction. We're still tempted the old sinful nature is still there. We don't get it right all the time. We still fail and rely on Jesus to forgive us day by day. But there is a new desire and a new longing to be that person, a new ability to be that person because of the new heart that God has given us. Imagine you're work, walking up a hill and it's a hot day and it's hard work and your backpack is heavy and so you stop for lunch you take the food and drink out of your backpack and you, you eat it and you drink it and it refreshes you and it gives you energy. Instead of being a burden on your back to weigh you down and slow you down, it becomes something that energizes you and motivates you and drives you forward. The law of God is not just there to tell us off, to make us feel guilty, to say, oh, what a shame I have to obey this, I, I, I really hate it. But it's something that, that the, the Holy Spirit gives us into our hearts, gives us a, a desire to be that person, to please God and to become like Jesus and to love him. That is the new birth. So let me ask you what you make of Jesus' command. You must be born again. Are you born again? Are you born again? Are you satisfied with just being respectable just trying to do your best and being no better or worse than the people around you, having moral standards, being able to look down on other people, being religious, having some church involvement, being respectable? Or is the spirit at work in your life? And maybe that's only just beginning to happen for some of us. As you hear the message of Jesus, can you see that it's true? Can you see honestly your own sinfulness as someone who is lost without God? Someone who causes great harm to yourself and to others? And, and is the Holy Spirit helping you to face that and to know that you're, you're loved 
and forgiven and accepted by, by a God who would even die for you, who would even become like you and suffer and die on the cross, by a God who, who raises that, that, that person, who raises you to, to new life and gives you the hope and confidence of eternal life. Are you someone who comes to Jesus and seeks him and follows him? There's a, that hymn that I mentioned, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Is that you? Do those words speak about your life? Would you make those words your own? A wretch, lost and found, blind and now seeing. George Whitfield was a preacher in the 18th century revival and a respectable wealthy woman asked him, why do you keep on preaching the same thing? Why is it that again and again you choose those same words, you must be born again? And he replied, because madam, you must. very loving Heavenly Father who wants us to identify as his children, to know that we're loved by him, and he gives us his spirit. There's a verse of scripture which says, his spirit bears testimony with our spirit that we are his children, crying, Abba, Father, that means Daddy. Isn't that wonderful? Let's stand and celebrate that together. That the highest king should welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in all his love for me. All his love for me. Who the sun sets free. At last he has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, who the sun sets free, always free indeed. I'm a child. Yeah.
let's, uh, let's say together the words on the screen. Lift up your hearts. We lift thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Please do take a seat as we, as we pray. <coughs> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one sacrifice of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, offering and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, he instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, saying, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Well, if you regularly take bread and wine at this church or any other church, then you're very welcome to come and receive with us in a moment. If that's not something that you uh, normally are in the habit of doing, then please just do stay in your seats and take the opportunity to think about the words that uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be singing and the words that you've been hearing uh, and reflect before we carry on with our, our service. Um, we, we like to remind people not to receive the wine if, if you have uh, at the moment something that might be infectious to others, a cold, sore, for example, uh, flu or symptoms a bit like that. Um, if you are more vulnerable, more cautious, then feel free to, to come forward first. You don't have to wait your turn. Just come, uh, come up at the front and be the first person to drink uh, from the wine. You could also ask for a fresh uh, cup if you like. We've got some spare ones here and we could switch over to those um, if you'd like to do it that way. Or just receive the bread if you, if you prefer. Let's draw near with faith and let's eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for us.
What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. Please do take a seat. Thank you very much for being with us. This will be the right moment to collect children from their 
uh, from their groups. If they're under eight, the older ones will be brought back here. Um, please do stay for a little bit if you can. I don't think we had anyone uh, setting up coffee this morning, so there might be a little bit of a delay, but if you don't mind hanging on for a few minutes, I'm sure there'll be some coffee and tea between us. Uh, and uh, please do stay in and chat and say hello if you can. Thank you.